Good morning and good afternoon and good evening to wherever you are in the US. Um, I'm here in Brisbane, Aust at Queensland, Australia, and we've got some uh, guest speakers today who will be joining us from New Orleans. Thank you for your patience um, in what feels like day 100,000th of the quarantine lockdown, our technology um, you know, took, was a bit challenging this morning, so I apologize that we're starting a bit late. Uh, th thanks for hanging around. Very pleased today to introduce some of our current Oshner students who are in phase two at the Oshner Clinical School. And they're gonna to talk to you a little bit today about some of the community outreach projects that are, are student uh, led and student driven um, as part of their um, experience at the Oshner Clinical School. So I'm just gonna tell you their names and then we'll go straight into the presentation and we'll have time as well for questions at the end of the presentation. So joining us today to talk to you about medical student community outreach, we have Melanie Wise, Nadia Hussein, Iman Malik, Kelsey Handorf, and Kathy Liu. Thanks you guys. So I'm gonna share my screen now so we can all see the presentation. And then we'll, we'll turn over and I'll let the students do the talking. All right. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Melanie. I'm going to go first, I believe. Um, I like to look at myself, but I can only see the screen. So we'll see how this goes. Um, I am a fourth year at UQ Oshner, and we'll talk about some of the outreach things that we do here um, in New Orleans. And if you guys have questions about some of the things that we had done back in Brisbane, we'll happy to address that at the end, but we didn't make a slide for it. So if you have questions, just let us know and we'll answer that at the end. Um, so I am the OMSA, the Oshner Medical Student Association um, Senior Outreach Coordinator. Um, and last year I was a junior outreach coordinator. And so my role is kind of to find outreach events and volunteering things for our students to participate in in the community. Um, if some of you don't know a whole lot about New Orleans, it is um, a very vibrant community. Um, there is so much culture and everyone just kind of, um, I don't know, bands around themselves and love each other and do a lot of community things. Um, and so it's a really great place to get involved in that. Um, and then Oshner itself is, is quite a large hospital system in the way that um, they do a lot of outreach at the hospital that we get involved in. Um, and they sponsor sports teams and stuff like that. So there's kind of a lot of different areas in which we get involved. Um, case in point, this first slide we have is about the short-term volunteer things that we do. So these are kind of like one-off um, weekend events that happen with uh, like fairs or um, like health days or school events or things like that. So festivals, obviously New Orleans is pretty well known for all the festivals that they have. Um, so we often get students doing various things. So one of these pictures is the um, King Cake Festival um, that we had students volunteer at. Obviously, any sort of races that come to town, um, we can work in medical tents. Oshner is one of the um, sponsors for the Saints. So when they do practices in the summer, um, we often volunteer in their first aid tent. You can see that picture too. Um, Oshner also sponsors some school physicals at like high schools around the city. Um, so we'll go and we'll help the physicians do their physicals for them. Um, again, the community health fairs they have pretty often in the springtime. Um, and then also like any interest groups, if they wanna do some outreach themselves, they can, um, plan them and we just kind of recruit all the students and help organize for them. Um, so those are all like kind of one-off things that happen randomly throughout the year. And then if you want to move to the next slide, Cecile, we also have long-term projects that happen every year, all year long. Um, so we have particular student leads for each group that we have some of them here today to talk about their specific um, outreach groups. Um, or volunteering groups or projects, whatever we want to call them. Um, so that's like the whole long list of them. Um, ALS voice banking, we um, have a, a booth. And so people with ALS who still have their voice, they go into the booth and they start recording their words and their voice 
so that when they start to lose it, they can, you know, have this bank so that they can still continue to talk, um, which is really awesome and pretty popular. Um, we have Amon here talking about Luke's house, so I won't talk about that for her. Um, we do a fitness group, so they have classes, like this picture is they do yoga. Um, I think they do some more cardio, but I, I can't remember. Um, so they usually do that like twice a week, and that's open to students, to people in the hospital, everybody who wants to come. Um, we do a Habitat um, for Young Professionals is actually what it is, but I wrote Habitat for Humanity, and Kelsey is here. She'll talk about that for us. Um, JoJo's Hope is a swimming class um, or lessons that they do at one of the Oshner gyms and Walk with a Future Doc. We have Cassie here to talk about that. Uh, Miracles League is um, a sports for um, kids with disabilities. So we often have volunteers go and help um, coach or um, ref or whatever they need um, students to help with. Community Garden is a project where there is a garden near one of the hospitals. So we have students go and water um, and kind of help plants and, and that sort of thing. Um, and then we have our Oshner Joy, which is new as of this year. So we kind of go into the pediatric ward um, and draw and make cards or play music or do um, some mindfulness techniques. Um, and then we also kind of hold events for students every once in a while to let some steam or stress out to do some, some art. Um, and then STAR, we also have Amon talking about that. That is a summer program for high school students that she'll elaborate with. Um, and then Heroes League, I wrote that down and I forget what it is, which is really unfortunate. <laughs> I imagine it's like the Miracles League, but um, I don't know. Um, so yeah, we have a lot going on in New Orleans and we love helping the community um, just because it's such a tight knit community and it's really lovely to get involved in and we're happy to be here and I will move on to the next slide. Yeah, so obviously this year has not been normal for any of us in any way, pretty much. And so that also applies to um, like our community outreach efforts and our normal volunteering. So um, as things kind of started shutting down everywhere else, that also had to unfortunately include a lot of the projects that we normally do. Um, but I think it's really a testament to like our school and our classmates that everyone was still really eager to help out um, however they were able to. And so we were actually, you know, able to work together with the administration and student affairs to um, basically help fill needs that were coming up across auctioner, um, things that they had, like they were asking for volunteers for that students uh, were like qualified to help with. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of those projects because I think some of them are pretty cool. Um, we had a call center. So auctioner had a hotline um, for coronavirus that, uh, was really like overwhelmed really quickly because as we all know a lot of people had a lot of questions um, and so there were tons of people calling in long wait times and they that was the first project they asked students to volunteer for it and within about 24 hours we had over 100 students express interest in volunteering so um, that just goes to show you like everyone was really eager to help out um, so they got that up and running pretty quickly um, and had students helping take calls help answer questions um, direct people to, you know, the right testing sites or um, that kind of thing. There was also in uh, another call center that was specific to like obstetric patients and that one uh, students helped kind of more proactively reaching out to uh, pregnant patients and help answering their questions and any specific concerns they had. Um, another project we had was the family communication champions. So that one came up because doctors were finding that they were spending too much time um, trying to communicate with families. So, you know, the number of patients was going up really quickly. And as we know, a lot of hospitals had to stop allowing visitors, which means that they weren't able to be there with their family members. Um, and so students were able to kind of become the middle middlemen in that sense, um, you know, getting updates from doctors and then talking to the families themselves. So they were able to take a little bit more time um, providing updates answering questions from families, um, things like that. So that was able to help the doctors uh, save some of their time so they could focus on caring for the patients um, and you know, get those families some of the answers and, and have them be able to talk to someone still. Um, we also had some students um, who had lab experience in the past who were able to help with some of the testing efforts. So they ramped up 
testing really quickly. Um, and then as we know, like the need for PPE was a really big uh, issue in this pandemic and, and has continued to be in some places, but we had students who were able to help with the 3D printing and putting together some PPE, including like gowns and masks and face shields um, and getting them to, you know, different um, providers who needed them within our system. There's also the MedVantage Clinic, which was focused on like geriatric patients. And as we know, they were really high risk in this pandemic in particular. So students who were volunteering with that clinic were able to um, kind of help screen those patients to make sure that they were going to be prepared for upcoming changes and also to make sure that, you know, they were prepared for adapting to telehealth, which can be really tough with, you know, older patients sometimes um, so that they would still be able to get in touch with their doctors when they needed to. And then one um, thing more recently that's actually just started up in the last couple of weeks is Auctioner started a big um, prevalence study to kind of figure out what the prevalence of COVID has been in New Orleans. And so they set up testing sites all across the city. And we've had students volunteering across at all those testing sites um, and helping in so many different ways, you know, handing out masks, helping people maintain social distancing, helping even process lab samples and things like that. Um, and they were able to test over 3,000 people in that first week already. So um, hopefully things will be like back to normal way before you guys are here. But I thought it was a really cool um, way to show, you know, that um, these things have been a really important way, part of our like volunteer efforts, even though we had to kind of change things up, we still found ways for students to like really contribute and um, yeah. Uh, I think we're going to talk about now some of the specific projects. So I think Iman is going to take over now. We'll go to the next slide. My name is Iman. Um, I'm going to be talking about some of the long, long-term projects that are available to students who are at Oshner. Um, and the first one we have here is the UQ Star Mentorship Program. This is actually brand new. I think last year was the first. Last year was the second year we had it, and it's a fairly new thing. The STAR program itself has been around for a while. Um, Oshner sponsors 15 to 20 high school seniors to come in and learn about STEM. They get to follow some doctors, they get to work with surgeons, they get to learn things. And one of the Oshner students, or UQ Oshner students, um, saw that it was a great opportunity for medical students to participate as well, because I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I personally needed a lot of mentorship when I was senior year of high school. Frankly, I still need mentorship now. Um, and so what we did was um, recruit some of the medical students and pair them with one of uh, one or more sometimes of the high school seniors. And then in addition to like talking to them about life and college applications and other sorts of things, we also um, held some clinical skill workshops like intubation with the, um, the sim lab and just other fun activities for them to kind of give them a, a kind of preview of what medical school could look like to see if it's a potential option for them. Um, we can move on to the next slide the next project, I think. Um, the second project, and this is really, truly my favorite part of medical school, if I had to pick one experience that meant the most to me in medical school, it would be Luke's house. I believe someone already asked if there's any student-led clinics available to work in, and this is um, closest to that, uh, as far as I know. Um, Luke's house is a free clinic. Um, it's a nonprofit that serves the Spanish-speaking patients of the greater New Orleans area. Um, they share a building with Healthcare for Homeless, which is a photo of that um, right here, as you can see. They provide primary care and gynecological care, um, so pap smears. And what, how it works is um, medical students from Tulane, LSU, and now Oshner come in to help. Um, what we get to do is triage the patient, take them in, do their vitals, ask them what's going on, do a brief physical exam if you're comfortable doing so, and then you present to an attending who's also a volunteer there. Um, sometimes we even have to translate for them because some of the attendings don't speak Spanish. And it is like a magnificent experience in that you have, you're directly able to help people who honestly don't have any other way to get that help. Um, and it's double challenging to not only lose, use every single clinical skill you've gathered over the past three to four years, but also then do it in a language that's not your own in my case. 
Um, so that's a very, very, very special experience for me. And um, I think the most exciting thing I heard about when I was in phase one coming into phase two. And a newer thing within Luke's house is just lots of opportunity for education. If you're into preventative care, there's um, new workshops with diabetes education, hyperlipidemia education, and even um, education regarding contraception where we partnered with Planned Parenthood in the area. So that was very exciting. We can move on to the next slide. Hi, I'm Kelsey. Um, I'm the coordinator for the Habitat for Humanity group. As Melanie said earlier, we're called the Habitat for Young Professionals is our like chapter of it. Um, so we basically part we partner with um, Habitat for Humanity to come in once a month, at least with them, um, and help alongside with building of houses. So Habitat for Humanity is great in that it plays a large role in New Orleans because um, affordable housing is a big issue in New Orleans and the community or the county of New Orleans has actually provided free land um, to Habitat for Humanity to provide these houses which decreases their cost even more um, and since Katrina that's ramped up a lot and so they've been able to build about 700 houses in the last 150 years so they really need groups like us to come in and help them and since um, we're considered a professional group, we're much, they like our help a lot more than other groups because often um, the younger high school com groups come in and they can't utilize them as much because they can't give them as much responsibility. So it works out in our favor. And it's nice because it's not completely about medicine, but it connects you back to the community. So you're able to meet people from around the community. We work with a lot of military people that also volunteer with them and you meet the families that are going to um, eventually call these houses their home and they're able to sh describe to you um, how the healthcare professionals play a role in their lives which is very interesting um, and you're also able to socialize with your classmates outside of the hospital setting and learn some new skills that you might not know like i never knew i could um, put a roof on a house, but now I have. So it's quite a fun project to be part of. Um, and I've liked it so much that I actually, um, I'm a core volunteer, so I go out three to four times a month um, when things are normal anyway. Um, but that's everything for Habitat, at least. So you can, next slide. All right, hi, my name is Kathy. Um, so I run Walk With a Future Doc. Uh, it's part of the national project. Um, actually, so this is part of our fitness project. It's um, partnered with the OMSA Fitness as well as uh, Le Petit Artist um, for promoting fitness in the community. So for as far as Walk With a Doc goes, it is a national chapter where they start where um, doctors and medical students encourage their patients to go out in the community ever so often to go on these walks that last anywhere from 15 minutes to an hour depends on the fitness of your patients and then toward the end of the walk we or throughout the walk we give a uh, a health related topic talk to them and um, we also can give out these pedometers uh, like this kid is wearing there and uh, track their progress of walking um, so anybody is welcome in the community and uh, a lot of time um, we're trying to get a lot of doctors to come out as well and um, just kind of promote health and in general. Um, so for the other part of our health promotion is uh, Melanie talked about it a little bit earlier, the OMSA fitness. So we would do yoga or uh, water sports. We have a pool here. We'll do some water aerobics. Um, and some boot camps around the hospital just so that people can, this is for employees and um, uh, other medical students as well. So after a long day, you can unwind a little bit with yoga. Uh, and as far as the La Petite Artist goes, they join us, um, or Ashna Joy rather, um, they join us by hosting dance lessons. 
so they have um, these monthly uh, monthly different type of dance, like contemporary dance, uh, salsa, wh uh, whichever uh, instructor they can find. They will run a four course series every other month on these different types of dance. Granted, of course, right now everything is kind of shut down for COVID, but hopefully, like. Um, Nadia said, before you guys come here, it will all be over and we can go back to these activities. I also just want to mention that there's also always the possibility of starting up new projects. Um, so whether it's like a one off, you know, you hear about some cool thing going on in the city that you think we could help volunteer at or you um, want to start another long term project, we're always like open to new projects. So if you if you don't see something that you particularly love or you have another idea, there's always the opportunity to start something new. There are supposed to be emails on that last slide, but apparently we couldn't see them. Um, but y'all are welcome to give out our emails if anybody has questions. Thank you very much. And that I was I noticed there weren't email addresses there. So I encourage any any of the attendees to today's webinar, feel free to reach out to UQ directly and we can pass your email query on to our, our students. Thank you very much for that overview, you guys. I thought that was just so impressive to hear about the various projects. We're getting some questions coming in on the chat line, but before we get to those, I thought I, I want to ask, were, were these the kinds of activities or projects, volunteer activities that you guys might have been involved in before you got into med school? Is this you know, a pattern that, that you're continuing from, from before medical school? Um, yeah, so I used to volunteer in animal shelter before medical school. So I do volunteer a lot in the, in the past. Um, and also I do, I do one of, it's not really associated with Oshner quite yet. Uh, I'm trying to think to organize a group of students who will do that in the zoo and the aquarium, in the, our local zoo and aquarium help out with them. So that's something that I've just consistently been doing all throughout. Uh, yeah, I was definitely involved in Habitat for Humanity before I got here. Um, and I've been doing it since high school and I've now been in four states that I've been able to volunteer with that partnership. So it's something I wanted to continue working with in um, medical school. I've also volunteered with other stuff like the OB hotline I was part of. Um, yeah, I just like volunteering, so. That's great, thank you. Um, we're getting some, que some specific questions about projects. Yes, we do have volunteer activities that are available when you're in Brisbane. Um, we probably don't have quite the same breadth, but there, there are some activities available to our year one and, and two students. Another question is asking if there's a website where we can find a list of these projects. We probably don't have all of the information specifically on one website, um, but if you go to our, our current website about the UQ Oshner MD program, we'll have some links to some, some of these activities. Actually, the um, OMSA website, um, the Oxford Medical Student Association website, there is an outreach page. Now, it's not like completely comprehensive, but it does have a list including some of those long-term projects. Um, so you can always take a look there if you guys want to review those. Thank you. Yeah. We've got a question asking, um, aside from Luke's house, what other opportunities exist to engage with underserved communities in NOLA? Um, and that includes people who are use substances, sexual gender minorities, people living with HIV, et cetera. Does anybody want to take that question? I mean, one obvious answer is working with Healthcare for Home Homeless, who takes um, medical student volunteers. There isn't an organized group through Oshner that, that goes together, but like I've worked there myself in the past, and homeless people are obviously one, one marginalized population that exists. Um, there's also connections you can find when you when you reach out to, for example, the director of healthcare for homeless or the director of Luke's house. They can go ahead and help you find um, other ways to work with specific populations. One thing I wanted to mention, which was a one or two time volunteer thing, um, was our Gold Humanism Society put together a um, event where we I forgot the organization's name, 
but we prepare the meal and then serve a meal and, and eat with people who need it. Um, I believe it was women and children specifically, but there's lots of various ways um, that aren't just limited to like clinical expertise um, that you can use to give back to the community. Yeah, and also, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> also, um, so we have different societies in uh, Oshner as well. So as different parts of societies that you can volunteer, um, you can have your own outreach projects too. So our society in Lejeune, we started a volunteer with Second Harvest, which is serving mostly the homeless population or people who uh, doesn't have food, enough food to eat. So we go, we'll go out there and um, help them with, just all kinds of things, including food distributions and any background work that they need to be done. I was just going to add that a lot of the health fairs too um, are geared towards populations that may not necessarily uh, always have access to health care or um, may not have great health literacy. And so those are good opportunities. I mean, they're not like specific to those populations that you mentioned, but um, you know, it's a good way to, to help out people who may not be going to the doctor regularly or whatever and help um, you know check check their blood pressure and talk to them about um, healthy blood pressure and things like that so that's another way that you can kind of help out in that way great thank you we have a specific question about language skills I was interested in Monta here you talk about um, speaking Spanish at Luke's house so a students asking if speaking French is helpful for volunteering at the clinics um, maybe someone who speaks French might be better able to answer this. It's my understanding that Creole um, is very different than French, so, you know, having a little bit might help you out with some of the patients in more rural areas around here. For the most part, the, the most I've seen um, French come in handy is for our medical students who are going to do a rotation in Haiti. Um, that's really all the French encounters I can think of. I think, I think language skills are valuable no matter where you are. And I know you guys would have had that experience of coming to Australia where yes, English is the official language, but I'm sure there were at times you heard phrases and, and some of our slang terms that were probably unfamiliar to you as American students in Australia. So not quite another language, but it, it does you know um, familiarize you with some of the challenges of communication. Um, we've got a student asking um, if you're able to access uh, volunteer opportunities only in the New Orleans area or uh, can you also access opportunities across Louisiana? Um, I mean, we tend to be more focused in the New Orleans area because that is where, you know, we all live and where most of our clinical sites are. Um, so, yeah, I think most of the things we do are you know, closer to, closer to the city, but um, there's nothing to stop, you know, anyone if they were able to find other things going on in the state um, and get a group together if that's what they're interested in doing. And do you find in, in your student population, do the majority of students participate in, in at least one volunteer activity? I would say for sure. Um, everybody, whether it's just because their friends group wanted to do it or, you know, they have a passion for something, but they're so easy and in a normal setting in a normal year, sans COVID, um, like we have things going on in town, like every weekend, um, every week, you know, the fitness stuff is every week, Luke's house is every week, um, habitats once a month, um, festivals are like every other, you know, day here. So there's always something in a normal time. Um, so hopefully when all of you guys come, it'll be back to normal and there'll be so many things to do that like you would be bored if you didn't participate in something. So, yeah. We also try to make it easy for you to know what's going on. So, you know, we have the weekly newsletters that go out that usually include um, anything that's happening that week and uh, the website will usually like, there'll be sign up so you can kind of take a quick look at what's available on any given weekend when you have time and, and figure out what fits in there. And we've also got a question from a student saying, if, if you're interested in starting a new volunteering outreach program, what's the process? Are there any specific requirements? It sounds like some of the activities, you know, are existing and then the medical students have enhanced it, but that some have also been created by medical students. Does anyone want to speak to, you know, how you would go about setting up a specific program if, if you had an opportunity? 
Yeah, I'll talk about it. Um, anytime somebody wants to try to start a, a volunteering event, it should, should. Um, in order for it to turn into like a long-term thing that we hope has longevity for years to come, we have like a, a little bit of a protocol in the sense that, you know, we want to make sure that you have, you know, enough volunteers that go regularly, um, that it's actually, you know, helping the community at large. Um, and so there's, we have a document that has like a little bit of a protocol in order for something to turn into a long-term project, but essentially we just have you try it. Um, you know, do a few events and see how it goes, and then it can turn into, you know, an official long-term project. Um, so, yeah, I mean, like Nadia said, if anybody is ever interested in doing something and wants the greater, you know, student body to be involved, we can always advertise it and help recruit students for you, um, you know, help in any way that we can to get people doing more in the community. So hopefully that answered it, the question. Thank you. Um, we've got a question about, um, are there any opportunities when you're in Australia to work or, or volunteer with Aboriginal Indigenous communities? And before I, I throw it over to, to you guys to respond, to talk about your experience, you know, I would say yes. I mean, that's, that's one of the underserved um, communities in Australia. Um, Brisbane has, you know, a large uh, population of, of urban Indigenous people, as well as some of some remote communities in Queensland as well. So that is one of the, the student activities that's available um, in first and second year. And also similar activities, you know, to some of the New Orleans based activities, particularly school outreach and so on. But would any of you like to talk about any particular activity you participated when you were at UQ in Brisbane? I think my favorite one, um, well, the one of a few ones that participated in Brisbane, it was really cute. It was called Teddy Bear Hospital. Um, so we go out to um, high school, well, middle school, elementary school, primary schools to uh, teach little kids a little bit about um, health care. So mostly it has, it's involving some protection, some maybe basic first aid and stuff like that. And we always have one person dressed up as a big giant teddy bear and then the kids love them. They just like hug and take pictures and stuff. So I think it's, the kids have a lot of fun out there and uh, it was really fun to be involved in that. And I believe they do try to sometimes involve in some of those um, uh, Aboriginal groups as well. Um, or like a little bit more out there where it's just not just in the metropolitan of the city area. Anyone else want to talk about their Brisbane experience? I also did a lot of volunteering with Teddy Bear Hospital because um, I think kids are adorable and teaching them about how to brush their teeth and to eat vegetables is super cute. Um, I'm not sure about specific volunteering for Ab Aboriginal communities, but I know that once you get into like clinical years, which I guess wouldn't be us, you can go to clinics that cater to that community. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm personally not aware of volunteering things related to that, um, but I do know another volunteering opportunity that uh, an Oshner student started there was um, dressing up as Disney characters and going to the children's hospital, and I believe they read books to them, um, so that was super cute. So I guess kid-focused things, um, but I'm sure there's other opportunities that I'm just not quite sure about. Yeah. No, I mean, I think you're right. There's a range of activities. Some of them are, are student-led projects, similar to what you guys are involved with in New Orleans, and others are available at some of the, the hospitals that we work here. I think Indigenous health is, is, has been and continues to be a big focus for, for Australian medical schools, because that, that group in particular, you know, tends to um, have health issues that we don't necessarily see to the same extent in the greater community. So at UQ, um, we've appointed in, in our medical school, we have an associate dean for um, Indigenous engagement, um, who's a, a colleague who's, you know, very well known um, in some of the work she does with Indigenous communities, particularly around things like resiliency and mental health and so on. Um, UQ last year launched its Reconciliation Action Plan. So this is a really important um, part of, of, you know, recognizing some of the challenges that our Indigenous community in Australia faces and, and how we can redress some of the, 
the issues around that. So, so there, there are opportunities in phase, phase one um, to, to be involved in, in some of the activities um, that we have going on. And so um, I encourage you to you know, check out our website and we'll make sure that we have information available about some of the, the things that are um, open to you while you're here. Um, we don't have any more questions coming through the chat line, so I'm just wondering, is there anything that you didn't cover in your presentation, you guys, that you might like to, to touch on, on quickly? And it can be, you know, not necessarily about volunteer activities or community outreach, but anything about your experience when you were both at UQ in Brisbane, but now that you're at the Oshner Clinical School in New Orleans. I think I just wanted to add, I know this is not about coronavirus, um, but the response that we have had this year really speaks to the resiliency and sense of community in the greater New Orleans area. Um, the way that volunteer opportunities adapted to be able to do a part of what they do regularly, even though times are crazy, um, I think really speaks volume about how incredible the infrastructure here is to take things that are unexpected. And I've never, personally felt as close to the people in the city until, you know, this pandemic happened and we kind of banded together to, to try to give back um, and make things work. So really pay attention not only to all the projects we do on a regular basis, but also how we make them work when things aren't going to plan. Um, I, I thought it was a fascinating thing. Thank you, Iman. Anyone else like to talk about their experience in medical school so far? Well, I see that there's a question about like staying on top of work, like med school work, and that actually kind of makes me think about one of the things I think that's been really great about this program is um, the kind of like mentorship and connection that we have between cl like classes. Um, so coming in as a first year, it's like super overwhelming. Um, I mean, just med school, it's a lot, you know, it's a whole new like style of learning. It's a lot of information, but the second years when I was a first year were such an invaluable resource. Like there's, you know, we have uh, tutoring groups, we have mentors through like OMSA um, and they are always available to answer questions. They help you figure out what kind of resources to rely on. Um, help you prioritize, like there's always gonna be, uh, you know, a degree of, you have to adapt to your own learning styles and things like that, but um, there really is just like, there's an infinite number of resources when it comes to studying for medical school and our classes over the years have gotten really good at figuring out what are the things that work. And so I think that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, you're gonna get a lot of support from the years above you and from your classmates and that's something to, um, definitely take to heart, you know, they know what they're talking about. They've learned from experience. So um, I thought that was a really helpful thing to adapt um, to all the changes. Yeah, I definitely agree on that extent. I think um, my, my experience with um, UQ Oshner is that you go to Australia and most of you are so far away from home that you just kind of create this bond with each other that's so different from any bond that you would create in undergrad or any other medical school that you, you do, you go to. Um, and I think this definitely like, I for sure made some lifelong friends in medical school, um, like right from the beginning. And we were all just really close all the time. We give each other, not just like support with schoolwork, but also moral support, just like, any any time there's any issues, I feel like I can run to all of my friends that I made in medical school. So I think that was a really cool thing. Um, another thing that I really liked is the fact that I can actually move to a different place after two years and explore different locations. Um, I'm not from uh, New Orleans or obviously Australia, so it was great to be able to travel and explore these new places and meet new people and see new culture. And I wanted to quickly add on the topic of staying on top of your medical work. Um, it's really hard. And I think it's even harder if you deny yourself what makes you happiest or what makes you feel like this is all worth it. 
for example, first and second year, I didn't see too many patients and I didn't volunteer as much because I was studying for step one and I wasn't happy and I didn't study well. And when it came to phase two, when I moved to New Orleans and I found all these opportunities, I remembered why I started medicine in the first place. I remembered what I used to enjoy in college and high school. And it gave me the fuel and motivation to continue staying on top of my medical school work. So I did a lot better second um, in phase two than phase one, just because I realized that what I need is those micro interactions with other human beings that make me feel like what I'm doing is meaningful. Um, so I think that community service, depending on who you are, community service can be completely intertwined and linked to your to your ability to to do work and stay on top of your work. That's great. Thank you. Kelsey or Melanie, would you like to add anything? I mean, both about your experience, but also, yeah, I thought that was a great question about how, how you stay on top of medical school, because there's, you know, you know, it's going to be challenging when you get that offer, but I think the reality is probably even more challenging than you expected. Um, I think I'd say there's not really like a magic trick to like help you stay on top of everything in med school. Like you kind of have to just, at least for me, deal with it. You're not going to be on top of it as much as you want. Like in your head, you think, oh, I, if I just create this list and I'm going to study this, like you always run out of time. There's always more things to study. Um, and in phase one, it's like, it's not as easy as mom's saying because you don't have as much connection. Um, but when you're in phase two and you actually get to see patients and see like what you've been learning and how it interacts, like how it actually makes a difference in how you take care of patients. And then you like see the light at the end of the tunnel, like, oh, I'm going to finally be a doctor. And this is like, it makes sense, everything I've been doing. But yeah, there's not really, I mean, it is, it's overwhelming at first and having that community really helps you. Um, because everyone feels that same way. And they'll tell you a million times, like going into med school is like drinking out of a fire hydrant. Like you get a lot of information all at once and it's really hard to take in, but everyone's in that same situation. So making those connections is really important. And just knowing that everyone being in the same situation that you can rely on each other um, and you can get through this. Thank you. Melanie, anything to add? I, I feel like we've gotten, you know, sort of overall picture of, of how medical school, each person deals with a little bit differently. Do you have anything you'd like to add to that? Sure. And sorry, I stepped away for a second. Um, my perspective is probably like a little bit different. I actually moved to Australia with my husband. Um, so I had, I fortunately had him that I could, you know, cling to and, you know, turn to. I didn't actually move there, you know, all by myself. Um, so that was a little bit different. I would say that being in Australia and having to learn medicine, you definitely learn how to prioritize your time in the sense that you want to go on vacation or you want to go to the beach or you want to go all these places. Um, and to know that you still need to learn medicine and study, you, I, to me, I think you get better at being efficient in your studying so that you can spend the extra time playing when you have it. Um, so, so that, um, and then coming here, like just clinical years are so much better and different and exciting. And you're finally practicing the things that you've been learning. Um, and for me, I want to be a psychiatrist. So actually like, you know, being with people and talking to people is way better than having your head in the book, um, in the books. So, yeah, I mean, but every med school is the same in a sense that, you know, you study for two years and then, you know, you practiced for two years um so but I've really loved our experience and I missed some of you guys I'm sorry I actually have a five-month-old too so I stepped away for a second because it's past his bedtime and my husband's like what um anywho so I imagine everybody gave really great advice also um but yeah we all I think I can speak for all of us that we love it and we've made it work and you guys can make it work too and yeah join us <laughs> Thank you. And yes, I hear from some students who have, you know, young families and that. And I think that's an extra layer of challenge to medical school. Um, we've got a few minutes before the end of the webinar, so I'm going to put all my all you students on the spot and say, think back to when you were contemplating coming, you know, to um, Australia to begin medical school. What's one thing that you wish somebody had told you before you arrived in Brisbane?
it is deathly hot there. <laughs> and when you step off that plane, you come from winter to summer and it's Australian summer. So like be prepared for it to be very hot. Um, the people in Australia are super nice not to worry. And you can literally buy anything in Australia that you can get in the United States. So don't feel the need that for two years, you're not going to have anything and you need to bring everything you've ever owned. Um, you can purchase it in Australia. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Kelsey. Also, I think setting up something um, like money transfer or a system where you want to use consistently with a credit card, uh, to get those points, say, if you want for travels, or um, if you want to just set up a transfer-wise, something free, you can transfer Australian to American dollar, and uh, it can keep you up to date to, for currency exchanges. That's quite useful as well. Thanks, Kathy. I think one of the logistical things that actually worked out well for me because uh, I had heard some advice uh, previously, but I think where you live can make a really big difference in your day to day. Um, and I think like living close to the, the bus line, I mean, there's like a guide that you'll get that'll have these details, but I would just say definitely keep an eye on that because if you live close to the bus line, it's super easy to get to any of the hospitals to get to the campus. Um, you also want to live walking distance to things like places you want to be. Um, and so I would just say keep an eye out for where you live and make sure that you prioritize that because I think it, it makes a big difference in your like quality of life too. Great. Thanks, Nadia. I would probably say become a minimalist. You know, I moved there with two suitcases, but for some reason when I came back, I had like four and paid a whole lot of money to pay for those suitcases to come back. So if you can become someone who, you know, rotates through a few outfits and doesn't like trinkets or souvenirs then do that <laughs> great thanks thanks Melly. come on lucky last i mean i definitely agree with the minimalism i literally remember watching a documentary on netflix called minimalism as i was packing to get ready to go to australia but if i have to think back to when i was debating whether i accept um this acceptance or not and move to australia like i wish what I would tell myself is that, like, you have no idea how fast it's going to go by. Like, it's, it was just extraordinary. Um, it's like a time warp. And so if someone had told me that, I, I, I think I would have done things a little bit differently and been less nervous to go. And, and it's hard to explain. You have to come to find out. Thank you very much. I loved all those words of wisdom. We had a couple more questions come in. A student asking if you can drive in Australia on your visa. Not on your visa, but you can drive if you have a valid driver's license from, from your home country. And also a comment about the weather. Summer is not fun. I will challenge that. Brisbane summer has a few weeks where it, it is, you know, even people, even, you know, um, people who live in Brisbane find it hot and humid. But the majority of the rest of the year, our weather is quite spectacular. So as with all of our um, participants today, I encourage all of you to, you know, continue with your application and we look forward to welcoming as many of you as possible to Australia in January. Please join me in thanking our, our um, uh, presenters today. I appreciate the time that you've taken to talk to, to our prospective students. So thank you, Melanie, Nadia, Iman, Kelsey and Kathy. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>